Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Janet Giesen from Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center here at NIU. I apologize, I've got quite a head cold, so I sound like I'm talking in a paper bag. Um, but I'm thanking Stephanie to help introduce the uh, workshop today and uh, round it out at the end. So I welcome you to um, this workshop. I've given it once before. And as you know, with all of my workshops, I tend to tweak them as I go. Um, so if you've attended this workshop before, um, you might have gotten some or get some new information um, by the end of the day. Uh, getting your students to read, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, it's something that all of us have issues with who deal with students. Um, and by the end of the workshop, uh, by one o'clock today, I hope that you can um, take away some uh, tips and techniques that will help you um, getting your students to read. Yes, Isabel, I know it's a very difficult challenge, um, um, but hopefully you'll get some pointers today. Okay. I'm not going to have the camera on today, but in case you don't know who I am, that's me. It's a few years ago. Um, and what we're going to cover today, pretty much issues about reading and why students don't read. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some issues that might you, you might be aware of, why students don't read, and ones that you also might hear um, about from colleagues and yourself. And we're going to do a review of an inventory. And I have given this workshop where I have um, uh, the simulcast where some of the people were actually in the audience. And there are some links in the PowerPoint presentation, which I'll send to you at the end of the day. But because we're online today, um, you won't be able to access the links. I can't click on them. So I did send to you um, an email not too long ago, earlier this morning, uh, with a piece of paper or a document um, on, a, on an inventory. If you don't have it, it's no big deal. Um, but if you do, if you can access your email right now, you can open that up and um, use it when we get to that point. And then we're going to examine some techniques that you can really get your students engaged with um, and to help them as they read. And one of the big issues about reading is that students just aren't engaged or they might have difficulty just with the, the task of reading in itself. So I'd like to start off with a term called illiteracy. And I really wasn't familiar with this myself until I did this workshop um, a year or so ago. But our students are able to read. They would not be here at NIU if they didn't have some ability to read. But many of them choose not to read for whatever, and mostly it's because they're not interested in reading. So really that's called illiteracy. They are literate people, but they just don't read for a variety of reasons. So we know they have the skills and the abilities to read, but they just don't apply them. So hopefully you can move some of the information that we're going to be gaining today into the classroom. Uh, to help them become more interested in the materials that you do assign for them. And some basic information here about um, really what happens when students have poor reading habits and how it can um, affect them. Obviously, if they don't read the material that's required for class, they won't be prepared to discuss in a lecture or a classroom discussion, they might have difficulty even writing their responses in a discussion forum on Blackboard. Um, but it can also affect them emotionally and socially. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a resource on this particular slide. I'll see if I can find it and then put it on there before I send this to you. But reading, if students with poor reading habits really are not well prepared to be in college because having poor reading habits also can affect their writing skills. And with this, it becomes apparent that they just aren't able to learn as much if they don't have these good reading habits. Uh, we know that because they don't read well, they don't do well on assessments or performances. Let's say for an exam, if they don't read the chapters or the material that you have set aside for them, they might not be able to answer the questions. There are also, also um, statistics that show that students who have poor reading habits can have or be at a risk for certain health problems. 
most of them, most likely, they are going to fit in this top group here uh, of that bullet point where they have a low self-esteem. Students know who they are, and they know that they might not have good reading habits, which can really affect them uh, personally. So they might have this low self-esteem of themselves because they know they don't fit in with the rest of the group. Many students who have really poor reading habits don't make um, their graduation. There's really um, more than 40% of the students who begin a college career as a freshman drop out before they gra graduate. And this one disturbing statistic is that some students who do have poor reading habits really are at risk for um, potential suicide. I was doing some research on this, and they're also saying as adults, adults who don't read well can actually have very difficult times even medicating themselves because they can't even read the prescriptions they might be given for a doc from a doctor. So in general, they have shorter, less healthy lifestyles because they have poor reading habits. And many of these issues begin at a very young age when children are growing up and they don't have parents or caregivers to maybe help them read. So there are many, many issues, and we're not going to get into that. Um, but we know that students who do read well can really be well adept at um, being proficient at the university setting. So here are some statistics that kind of um, pull us all together. There was a attitude report from fall of 2009. This has been going on for several years now. And the students are actually um, asked questions on this attitudinal survey to um, indicate their level of agreement with specific questions. And I pulled out a few that I thought were telling, that students said that they would refuse really to receive help on improving their reading skills, and about 28% of those students, um, which is pretty remarkable. So, you know, uh, almost a quarter of the students would really not want to receive any kind of help with their reading skills. Almost 50% of them really don't have any good feelings about reading. They don't have any intrinsic satisfaction from reading materials. And that's pretty disturbing when you think about it. That's half of the students that we see. And of that group, about this satisfaction from reading, males have much less satisfaction about reading than do females. And then they were also asked a question about reading serious books. And the serious books are the ones that we have our students read in classes, the textbooks, the other books that um, might help with that, and also journal articles is included in that. About 44% of the students do not really like to read the serious books. So then what that leads to is what we call a compliance problem, that students just aren't reading for a variety of reasons. And in any particular day in the survey, 70% of the students said, I have not read the assigned readings, which is really an amazing number. And I think all of us can kind of shake our heads up and down and say, yes, we know that. But the statistics of 70% really is quite high of the students who really have not read the assigned readings for whatever reason on a particular day. So I thought it was kind of interesting to bring in some statistics to show you about this uh, freshman um, attitudes report. And the report covered private schools, um, public schools, and most of the students in this particular year were, 60% um, of them were the um, Caucasian students, about 20% were black or African American, and then the numbers got smaller as far as each of the many other um, designators, um, Hispanic or Latino students, 8.1%, Asian students, Pacific Islander students, 3.6, and then others. Okay, so there's a question for you. Have you experienced problems with students not reading the required material? So it's a question, and all you have to do is go to the bottom below our names and click the little check mark. I see check marks. Alex, no, no problem. That's great. Would anybody like to share? Any stories they have about experiences with students not reading? If you have a microphone, you can click the talk box, or you can enter a chat at the bottom of the screen. 
Okay. Another question. Do you think it's your responsibility to help your students to read required course material? And again, you can answer that with a check mark. Okay, some of you answer yes, and most of you are answering yes. That's great. In addition to our jobs here as faculty, our careers as professors, instructors, TAs, or whatever, in addition to what we are teaching our students and are showing our passion and our love for teaching, it's also our responsibility to help students if they're struggling with reading. Now, I'm not saying that you have to spend lots and lots of class time to do this, but there should be ways and avenues that you can help your students do this. We have a reading clinic on campus. You might be able to take a little bit of time in your office hours or meeting students at different times to help them with reading, and there are lots of different types of techniques. So we're not going to really talk about the different ways of getting students to be effective readers. We're kind of working on the faculty um, part of the, the equation. Uh, where what we can do to help students to actually just become engaged with reading. But there are lots of techniques that students can get involved with to help them become better at reading. And Isabel, you've got a question there. We should stress the responsibility of the students to learn and seek help when necessary. Yes, that is true. We do need to do that. Okay. So, this is uh, one that I'd like you to either uh, provide a verbal response or to type your response to this question. What incentives do you provide your students to read required materials? So think about it for a second. And what are the exams? Yes, Kate. Anything other than exams is an incentive to get students to read material. I like that reading notes, projects, sure. Better understanding of the lab functions, sure. Um, they have to read something to complete a project, using websites to pique their curiosity. Great, excellent, great examples of ways that you can provide incentives. So without having to type in another response, think about this for a second. What happens then to students who don't read? How do you hold them accountable if they don't do the reading? You know, often we have rules in our syllabi that state you're required to read the chapter readings, you're required to take the exams, and so on. But some of the surveys that I was reading and the studies I was reading were saying that faculty really play a role in the problem by not holding their students accountable for the reading. And then Lisa, yes, they uh, poor performance, they get lower grades because they can't complete the assignments. And then we have the issue where the students are complaining, you know, they might be saying, well, I did read the material, but I really didn't understand it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Shao Kun, uh, they cannot complete the project or lower grades, sure. But if we do require our students to read material, then we must then hold them accountable. And we really should show a passion not only for our subject, but also an interest in the materials that we do assign to our students. Bill, you say I talk about reading material also so they know how interesting it is. Excellent. That's a perfect um, thought about you need to be interested in the reading as much as the students do. And if you do show that passion and that interest and show the relevance of the material that you're expecting them to read, then that can uh, kind of prove to be um, an incentive or a motivator for them to be able to read the materials. Okay. So I did some internet searches about what reading actually means and then found a site that um, gave some examples of what they are. So we're going to talk just real quickly about these. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but these are just different um, definitions or statements related to what reading actually means. So we can pick out particular words such as cognitive process, uh, interpretation, um, datum about a uh, particular state that is being presented. So those are kind of examples of, you know, what 
reading actually means. Here are some other ones. Written material intended to be read. That's kind of high on our list. Instructor assigned new readings. Uh, recitations. Um, some sort of performance and then prepared in advance. The act of measuring with meters or instruments. You know, the GA's task was to record temperature increases during the experiment. So those are all different kind, kinds of definitions or thoughts about what reading actually means. So I pulled them together into this main one, and I'd like your thoughts about this. So what does reading mean based on some of these um, pre previous examples? Uh, the complex cognitive process of decoding symbols for the intention of deri deriving meaning, which means comprehending information, and or constructing meaning of a written linguistic message. Do you think it's too complex? Does it make sense to you? What are your thoughts? Anybody want to uh, give a verbal thought or put a statement down there in the chat box? How do you think that this definition of reading fits with your definition of reading? Kate, go ahead. If you want to use your microphone, click and hold the talk button. Okay, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, yes, one Kate. of the things that I that I think is uh, very good about this definition is that it places and shows the interaction between reading and writing, basically. I mean, for college-level readers, um, you know, reading without writing about it, without note-taking or something like that is kind of you know, I mean, it's going to be a struggle for them, and those processes, to me, in my class, are very intertwined. Okay, great. Thanks, Kate. Anybody else would like to share their thoughts about this particular definition? Okay, great. All right, let's move on. Without going any further, I wanted to provide you with um, this schematic of really what reading actually means, what's going on with someone as they are reading. So you see the shape of a brain there, the person looking at a word, that blue uh, triangle highlighting the word cat, or the letters C-A-T. So they are reading that text, those three particular letters. As a person is reading something, there are a lot of processes going on. And it's really the concept of called what we call decoding. When you present information to a student or when someone writes a message, that's really called encoding. We're creating a message. Then the students, by reading or listening, are decoding, trying to make sense out of what they're hearing or what they're reading. So the different processes that are going on, obviously the first one is visual because they're actually reading the word. So those are basically steps that um, the information takes as it moves from the visual sensors to the brain where they're taking in the information and thinking about it or the cognitive processing. The phonological processing really is an auditory skill. It typically relates to words, but often occurs um, without um, something might be in print. So it has you or the person who's reading discriminate differences in speech sounds or under conditions that um, isn't really distorting the words that they're actually written properly on the page. That doesn't always happen, but the visual processing is, is there. The visual short or the verbal short-term memory relates to uh, anyone's ability to recall information. So in general, let's kind of just do a generalization that the majority of our students have probably seen a cat, whether it was in a picture or they might have one at home, or they've seen a video on YouTube. But then the students, they're not really, no one is really knowing this is all going on. This is all happening in our brain um, without much thought going on. But this verbal short-term memory um, in uh, uses something called this articulatory loop, which is this rehearsal. They're almost kind of like, like repeating this over and over in their brain in order then to identify what the word actually is. 
in addition to the visual processing, the phonological processing and the verbal short-term memory, there's also a processing rate. And I'm leaving that to the last is because this is one that's really important because it's relating to how quickly a student will take in and process information. And this can be quite varied among our students. Some students can process reading a lot easier than other students. So we have to think about when we're assigning reading to our students, whether it's through a textbook or through a course pack or whatever, we want to make sure that we're presenting the information that their reading ability allows them to actually understand the content or how they take in that information. Some people take a long time to read while others take a little bit shorter time. So with these four things happening, then as the arrow goes up at the top left, you're going to see then, then the word identification. It's, it's being conjured through this whole process. And then in memory, the word cat is there. And to the far right then, the text comprehension, the letter C-A-T then, will conjure often an actual image of a cat. Now, this is all happening with split-second processing. You know, again, we're not thinking about all these four processes going on, but this is what happens when actually reading takes place. So I just wanted to kind of bring that out so you have an idea. It's a little bit about brain theory, which I am not an expert, but it's kind of interesting stuff. And even today that um, the scientists who do work with brain um, studies and all still are kind of still amazed at how our brains actually do function. So then we have these problems with reading. And that was one of the reasons I decided to come up with this workshop in the first place because of the stories I've heard um, from faculty and also well, my own teaching that I know that students just do not read. And there's some points here that are kind of interesting. There's so much written but never spoken. And I think what that point is really saying is that think about all the books that are sitting in the library and all the pages within the covers of all those books, all of the written information that is not spoken. And what we're saying is that often a student can understand more of content that we require them to read if it can be spoken. And so we can take the information that we require them to read and we can present it in various ways in class, whether it's through a class lecture, whether it's a class discussion, whether the students are working in groups. Um, but one of the issues about reading issues problems is that, as this first point says, so much is written but never spoken. The second point, I think all of us realize that students read the words, but they're really not reading for deep understanding. So if you were to ask your students in the next class that you teach, I'd like to show of hands of all the students who read the work for today or the required readings, and you'll get a show of hands. And I bet many of them read the words but really didn't read for true understanding. And that's sad, but it's a very true statement. Then this decoding, as we just covered in the previous slide, students really aren't in the flow. And it all happens with that second point. They're not in the flow. They're not in the true um, ability of reading for meaning and deep, deep learning. And what we'll see a little bit later is that some researchers say that to be a better reader, students need to be able to visualize the material. And as that um, previous slide showed with the cat, that cat image is just kind of an inherent part of this whole processing of decoding. So the more a student can visualize the material that they're reading, they become more engaged with the material. And you'll see this with some of the examples a little bit later. And this final point talks about you as faculty really do need to make connections between what you're expecting them to read and who your students are. So if you can do some sort of maybe a survey in class, you could even start it now. It's not too late in the semester. Find out maybe what students' reading abilities are or capabilities. Um, find out their interest in reading. And then make some sort of connections between their interest in reading, what they bring to the classroom as far as prior experiences, and how it all fits with the material that you're actually um, requiring them to read. One of the um, articles I was reading talked about some um, consult uh, some 
people such as like our faculty development staff were interviewing faculty about what they required their students to read. And one of them said, I require my students to read 500 pages of text within each week of the semester. And the person said, well, why do you ask them to read that much? Because I used to read that much when I was in college. So that person was kind of flagged in the sense that we don't want to be expecting our students to do exactly what we did just because. What we should be thinking about is the um, relevance of the material and how important it is for students' understanding at that time. Okay, now this is a link that does not work in WIMBA, but if you have um, printed off that document or brought it up on your computer, uh, this is an inventory from um, a college, I believe, in uh, California, but I especially liked it because here's a sample of the first four questions or four or five questions. It's, it's an inventory that you can give to your students for them to be aware of the strategies that help them become better at reading textbook material. So if we can look at the first question, these questions are pointed um, directly at the students. What do you do if you encounter a word that you don't know? And they are to answer one or select one response that they feel is not the best strategy, as you can see on the print form if you have it in front of you. So if you were to answer this question, what would you do if you encounter a word that you do not know? Which is the answer that is not the best strategy? Then you can just type that um, in the chat section. Question number one, which is not the best strategy? Okay, most likely, yes, uh, Kate says C, yes, and that is correct. Pass it over and assume that you will understand it later. Obviously, that's not a really good strategy for information because that word could be really important for them to get even through the next material that's coming up. Okay, so the second one, what do you do if you don't know what an entire sentence means? What would be the um, response that you feel is not the best strategy for question number two? Okay, we've got some C's there, we've got some D's. Okay, the answer to number two is actually D. That is the one that would be the least effective. And what's nice about this survey is that in addition to the questions, the answer key then provides the, what the answer actually is and a reason why it would not be the best strategy. So this is something that you could use for your students and it actually kind of could help you too to kind of think about the text materials that you're actually assigning to your students. Um, part of the survey or the reading inventory at the top of the page when you eventually do click on the link uh, does provide other strategies that students can actually use to help them become better readers, not motivating them to read, but to become better readers. So it's really a really good source um, that I'd recommend maybe putting a link to it in your Blackboard course and have your students take it um, just to get them to be thinking a little bit more about their reading strategies. Okay, so we've gone over some brain theory and we've gone over some inventory, an inventory about student reading, and I would like to go into some tips to help students read. I think this is why you're right here for the workshop. And if you have any questions or thoughts along the way as I'm helping or going through each of these, um, please raise your hand or um, write a statement in the, uh, the chat area and I can definitely work with you on that. Most importantly, we need to think about when we're assigning reading for our students is that not every single course would re really need to require a textbook, you know, the de facto textbook. Now I know that students or TAs probably do not have an option of telling your students not to purchase a book. But think about it really seriously when you're planning your courses for the semesters ahead. Ask yourself, is the book really important for your students to actually be learning something? If you lecture or you prepare lectures directly from the textbook, 
that's really a poor use of your time and of your students' money. So think about it. You don't have to purchase a textbook every time um, you teach a class. You might want to consider a course pack of materials that might be uh, more appropriate. Um, the, one of the articles was talking about th taking your textbook and doing a kind of cri a triage or a ranking of how important that textbook actually is. Um, and if, it, if all of the material in the textbook is essential, then most likely it would be good for um, students to, to purchase. But it's just something to, to really think about. Um, students also have said that there really is no justification on why the readings have been selected. And that's something you might want to think about when you prepare your syllabi in the future. Or you could tell your students from this point forward, you know, here is why I have adopted this textbook for this class. And give them some reasons why you think it's important that they um, read the material and why you've chosen the particular books that you have. Um, students have also said that um, there's little or no um, difference between reading that is actually required to be successful in the class and then reading material that's labeled required. And then often there can be um, what some of the researchers call it a mismatch um, between the text level or the type of textbook and the levels of students' reading abilities. So that's something we do need to consider. If you are teaching a basic or a fundamental class and in a subject, you're not going to be requiring them to take or to read um, advanced text materials. Uh, the second point as far as less is more um, should apply to your course readings. That just because you have a textbook does not mean that the students have to read every single page. You might want to pick out what is more important for them to read. Um, you know, look at it carefully, look at the materials that are required, that you consider required, and choose the specific sections or chapters, and that way maybe students won't have to worry so much that, my gosh, I've got to read this whole textbook by the end of the semester, and I've got five other ones I have to read because of other classes that I'm taking. One thing you do want to um, consider is that the textbooks or the reading assignments should somehow connect to what you say in class. They should somehow connect to the course goals and objectives. The third point, you might think, well, I don't want to have to dumb down my classes because I have students who might be not so good at reading. But again, you want to select a textbook that does fit the majority of your readers. If you, if you select one that's beyond their capabilities, um, it's going to really set up um, almost this defense mechanism on your students, and they will become even less inclined to read the material. And use your syllabus as a teaching tool, as I, and I mentioned this earlier. Put some sort of a statement in there that tells your students why you have selected the readings. Um, provide some sort of background. Um, mention how the readings will contribute um, to the other course material that you bring in. As I mentioned, you're not going to be doing your lectures straight from the textbook. Uh, if that were the case, then the students wouldn't even have to come to class because all they would have to do is read the book. But do mention somehow, either in, um, in Blackboard, state it to your students and during um, a presentation beginning of the class, um, you know, how your textbook readings relate to what might be happening in class that day or that week or the semester, and how it also relates to maybe specific course activities that you have them doing. Okay, here are a few more tips to help students read. It wouldn't hurt to explain um, or maybe mention to your students how to even find the material that's worth their reading. Um, as long as you connect the uh, course readings with their goals, the course goals or the learning goals, 
more likely the students are going to be to actually read the assignments because they're going to think that it's worthwhile. If you think that material is really difficult for them to grasp, um, you might need to provide some sort of explanations that help them understand uh, moving from one section to another, how it relates to the course, and, and then how they actually can achieve by reading um, those materials. Um, if you can provide those explanations, the more connection they're going to have to the learning can actually the more you um, provide as far as uh, explanations of reading the students then will connect to it that much better so connect the reading to their learning and it can be through little statements it can be through parts of your discussions um, but provide some sort of relevance explanation of the relevance of the reading um, so they know that you're not just assigning reading just because it's a book that you like The point six is kind of important and, and different because often we provide a reading list in our syllabus that's based on the 16 weeks of the semester. So the students have an idea of what's to be expected. Some of the researchers are, were showing that that almost can not really scare students, but it would almost kind of put them in this, this defensive mode where they think, oh my gosh, I have all this reading, I'm not going to be able to do it. So a couple of the articles I read the, they said instead of making a list of all the readings required for the entire semester, they provided readings about two weeks or three weeks ahead of when it was due based on what they had to read for an exam or for a project or just for um, participating in class. Um, so it, it's counter to how many of us think about providing the information. And I think you know, it really depends on your students. You may have some students that are uh, really excellent, excellent readers, and they want to read well ahead of time. So maybe you could provide some of the material um, for the students who are the faster readers, um, and then hold off on providing the others um, with maybe two or three weeks ahead of time, um, providing the um, content-related readings and post it in Blackboard and do it on a regular basis. So again, it's, it's they're thinking, and based on the research, you know that um, these shorter, frequent lists tended to allow students more opportunity to actually read the the material. So that's something that's a little bit different than what we typically do. Um, but you know, signing reading within about two to three weeks of material can actually uh, increase the compliance of students reading. Previewing the reading is kind of interesting as well. And sometimes students need to be helped into the text. They need to see the, the correlations in the, in, in the way that the material works with them. Um, you can integrate the readings into your uh, class presentations. You can integrate it into uh, discussions. Often that does help in getting students motivated to read. If you just go along with your presentations every week and don't make some sort of connection to the readings, uh, the researchers are showing that students will be less inclined and motivated to read before the class. Um, you want to be able to mention specific readings uh, during the class period. And again, you could link it to, let's say, assignments. You could even link, and, link them to uh, group work. A uh, few students uh, even bother to use the material at all if those items are never integrated into the class lecture or class presentation. So you might want to pique your students' interest also with previews of what's coming up in the reading. You know, there may be some really interesting points that the students haven't even gotten to yet that you could mention um, in your class to help motivate them and to pique their interest. So, you know, these brief comments don't take that much time, um, but providing them about you know reading assignments, making them interesting and connected to what you've already learned, and then also connected to what the students are going to be reading once they actually get their self into the textbook. Um, point eight, 
using these activities and increase compliance. You know, compliance is the actual reading and the effectiveness of their reading. You might want to provide reading guides. I don't mean that you have to spend a whole lot of time preparing these, but you might want to summarize some important concepts that are found in the textbook or the other readings that you have them doing. And that would be especially helpful if there are concepts um, that students typically have difficulty grasping. Um, it might also include um, vocabulary words or technical words that the students might have difficulty understanding. So providing uh, maybe just like one page that would kind of highlight the entire chapter, or the, excuse me, the entire book um, that might be helpful for your students. And you might want to also explain to students how to effectively read the textbook. I mean, there really is a kind of a technique to reading books. And the books today um, are very often, they include color pictures, they include charts, they include diagrams, they might include a CD uh, that goes along with the book. So it wouldn't hurt to take some time out of class to kind of mention to your students, here's how this textbook actually works. You know, you've got some text in the column and then they might have these call out boxes that explain things. Um, and that way the students would realize that, you know, you've taken some time to think about this textbook, that there is some logical reason why it's been uh, required of, of us to, to, to purchase. So help your students understand how the textbook actually reads. Um, in the textbook, there are often questions at the end of chapters that act as study questions. Um, if those don't work for you, you could create some new ones for yourself, for your students. Um, some people think that those types of, um, I guess you call them advanced organizers, would limit students from reading the book because they would just use those study questions rather than actually reading the book. But, you know, make them so the students um, can use both of them uh, to understand the material that they're reading. There's also another technique that um, you can have your students do these short writing assignments based on what they're reading in class. Cue them with a couple questions. Um, ask students to uh, explore some certain concepts that they might find within the textbook. Again, these are questions that they could answer within Blackboard. You could um, have them answer them on index cards as they come into class. Um, but if you require your students to do this, often they'll be more inclined to read the material. The tip number nine, um, using class time. Some of the research has shown that if you take a little bit of time in class to allow your students to actually read the material, shows that you do have an interest um, in them actually reading. And I'm not, taking, I'm not saying that you have to take 20, 30 minutes out of each class period, but every once in a while, um, give your students a little bit of read time in class. And you could pick and choose the chapters, you could pick and choose the areas within the textbook uh, or the readings you have them doing, just because maybe that concepts or those chapters might be a little more difficult for students to understand and they would be able to ask questions of you right in class. Okay, a few more tips for helping students to read. Require prior reading. Now this is kind of like one of those duh uh, statements. Of course we want our students to read the material before they come to class. And one of the techniques that you can utilize to test to see if students have actually required uh, or have read the reading is to um, ask students randomly by name questions related to the reading. Now this might sound difficult to do, you might not know the students' names, but more likely a student is going to at least respond to a question that you have about the reading if you ask them specifically rather than just asking for a show of hands, you know, who can answer this question because uh, obviously um, many of the students haven't prepared for the class. But the more you do this in class, the more you specifically direct questions at students, um, or groups, or however you have them laid out in class, um, they are going to see that the reading is important for classroom discussion to actually occur. Um, and if they do read, 
ahead of time, it will then help them as students because then they won't have to be so inclined to cram before exams um, by reading all the material in one time period. Um, the testing over the reading material, I'm sure that you've had discussions with colleagues before, you've heard it from students. Uh, often students say, well, why should I read the material if you don't cover the material on exams? So you really do want to include test questions that does cover the reading material. I'm not saying all of the reading material, but maybe some of the reading material that also so somehow correlates to what's been going on in class as far as the discussion goes. So we need just to make sure that the students do this, but you need to make sure that you do test over the reading material rather than just the lecture. I've heard of a faculty member on campus who only tests on the reading material and does not test anything on what goes on in class. And I asked, I said, do students go to the class? And they said, yes, they do, because he's very engaging as far as a faculty member. But um, do think about this to make sure that you test um, over the required reading material. And there are test banks that come with textbooks. Our own publishers provide them. There are tests or you can create a test based on some of the questions that you might find at the end of the chapters to help students along with at least you know preparing for those, but um, don't avoid uh, testing over reading material. And then teaching the reading strategies to your students. <clears throat> um, this really has to do with how a student uses the textbook. It's kind of what we already discussed before. You know, some students don't even know how to properly highlight a textbook. Um, so if you think it would be helpful for them, maybe you might want to give them some examples on how that can actually be done. And I have different examples here if you ever want to make an appointment and we can talk about that. But these skills might seem really basic to us because we do highlight appropriately, but those kind of skills might not seem uh, or be inherently easy for some of our students. And we need to be thinking about too that, you know, we assume that once students are in college, they should act like college students. But especially if we work with freshmen, um, it, it just may not be as simple of a process uh, for some of them as it is for others. So, you know, provide them some sort of examples um, of how to use the textbook or how to um, highlight the textbook. Maybe how to annotate. Annotating is not something that comes easy for some students. Um, but by doing this, by showing them how to read effectively in a textbook, really does show you um, that you have taken some time to think about that this, this book is not something that should be just put aside for um, cramming later on toward the end of the semester for finals. Um, so, yeah, model, and model these early in the semester so the students aren't learning these new techniques toward the end of the semester when it might be a little bit late for them. Uh, it is also um, important that you use assessments to find out if students are actually working or reading required material. And these CATS or CATS, classroom assessment techniques, um, can be easily used in class. Um, simply having your students, um, let's say you can have them all raise their hand uh, after you ask this question, okay, I read my entire assi assignment for today, true or false, and ask your students if they've actually done that. So in a way, it puts students in the hot seat without any of them really being identified who did or who didn't. But it really wouldn't hurt to once in a while ask students anonymously um, to report if they have completed reading assignments for a given class period. You can make a, a simple um, a group of one with your students and carry on a conversation that way. Um, but really, you need to make sure that the students are complying with the, the reading assignments. And the only way you can find that out is if you really ask them really one-to-one -one or in the class itself, um, the group. And then finally, you know, get assistance if you need help. You know, we can help here in faculty development. There are a lot of resources that you will see at the end of this presentation. Um, most, I think all of them are online. They're all viable as of yesterday. 
um, but there are lots of great resources out there that can help you um, get your students to comply with reading and to helping them become even more motivated and engaged with the reading. So at this time, do we have any questions or anybody want to make a statement about what we've covered so far? You can either use the talk button, um, or you can raise your hand to talk, or you can type a question or comment uh, in the text box, the chat area. Otherwise, we can just move on to the next section. Alex, can requesting short reading summaries be helpful in assessing our students' reading comprehension? Sure. Um, that's an excellent way of getting them to do that. You can have them provide these as um, entrance tickets to a class. Uh, I've seen this where faculty have the students write these summaries down. Students write some summaries down. They hand them to the teacher as they walk into the classroom, and that's kind of like their pass to the class. Um, you can have them do them in class which then you know that they would actually do it. Uh, they can be done after class. You can have them uh, do short summaries in um, Blackboard discussion forms so you can read them very quickly, but that's an excellent way to request these summaries. Um, now, the issue is this. Are you going to grade these or are you going to give them a check mark? Many students don't like to do what they would call busy work if they don't get some sort of credit for doing so. So I would suggest maybe giving them one or two points for these summaries. You don't have to have them each week. You can have them do it maybe every other week or every other chapter or every section of a chapter. There's all these different um, ways that you can do this, but I think it's a great way to request these summaries. But I would mention to the students that they will get some sort of um, credit for doing that. So like I said, one or two points and then maybe that would be a total of maybe 10 points for the entire semester if they did um, five summaries or 20 points if they did 10 summaries or, or whatever. Good point, Alex. Anybody else? Okay. In the slide presentation, um, there were these four areas I had put down here as far as different uh, online resources. And I'll briefly talk about these. Um, Handmade Thinking is a really wonderful site there where a faculty member has created um, what I would call advanced organizers, these little shapes that help students think visually about their reading. You'll see examples of that as we go. Um, thinking Maps is really a very similar technique. I don't know which one came before which one. I'd have to do research on that. They seem quite similar. But the, um, both of the sites um, specify that Students need to be visually to they need to be visually presenting their their reading, uh, what they've gained from their reading, um, so they can actually think about it a little more. Advanced organizers are devices where students can um, you know help them um, transfer knowledge from this new information that's being presented to what they're actually gaining. I'll show you some examples of that. And then uh, the active reading is a module that helps students um, learn about being active in, in their learning skills. We won't cover that, but that is a resource for you. Okay, the first one is by Lawrence Musgrove. I believe he's an English teacher. I don't know what university he's from. But he presented or developed these 21 formats, as you see here, these little squares with images inside, that helps his students um, develop more engaged in critical reading habits, but he does it in a way that they're actually drawing what they're reading. And he selects or has, he actually goes over what each one of these symbols uh, represent. And then the students use them to draw their thoughts and what they learned based on what they were reading. All right, so I'll give you some examples of that. So what's interesting about this is he has the students do it individually, but what's even more, um, what I just call the cool factor of this, this concept, he has the students collaborate also on what they've read. And I think that's so important for the students to be able to understand what they're reading by actually 
talking about it. So this is just a, a small snippet of a larger image um, where the students have all this paper on a, a wall and then they use any of the 21 advanced organizers, I will call them, or uh, diagrams to then draw pictures of what they have actually read. But for them to do it together with other students really um, can be beneficial and, and it can be an exciting way for students to visually represent what they're actually reading in class. And then we have this technique called thinking maps. And this is um, a business. You would purchase these, um, whereas the other one you can just kind of use as ideas. But you can see that the the symbols of these maps are, are similar. They're structures. And you can almost think about these as advanced organizers, which means that you present information in advance of presenting new or reading new material. And I'll explain these as we go along here. OK, the circle map. All right. And all of these provide some sort of an example of a discipline specific topic. So the circle map is talking about you know defining uh, things within context. So the first one is write what you know about poetry. How do you know this information? So if you think about it, you know the, the center circle is the concept of poetry. And then the question that, that the students are answering, what do you know about poetry within the larger circle? You know, poetry can be short or long. It can be lyrical. It can be narrative. It provides imagery. So you know, those are the things the students know about poetry. And then in the box around it, you know, how do you know this information? Well, through songs that I've sung before, through nursery rhymes, you know, textbooks, and, and so on. So this is a way that you can give this to students as they begin to read new material or as they're working in a chapter. But what's interesting about this, you don't have to provide all of this information. This is what a finished circle map might look like. But you could provide, let's say, the term poetry in the center circle and then maybe one or two examples of what you know about poetry. Maybe you could provide the first one, say, it can be short or long. And then the students would start filling in the rest. And then they would, you could also provide maybe one way of knowing about this information. You could put an example of songs and then expect them to write four more or how many more that might be. So, But this would work for any kind of reading assignment um, based on whatever topic you might be um, talking about or studying at the time. A tree map, again, a similar type of thing. You will ask a question and then the students then would fill in the information. So what words are used to indicate math operations? You could put up, I would say, math operation vocabulary on the top line, and then the students would fill in the information as they're doing the reading. Uh, bubble map. Now, this one shows you where you can leave some spaces open uh, using adjectives, describe Julius Caesar, add a frame of reference to identify the point of view. Okay, so you don't have to explain each one of these, but you know, in the center, you have a sketch of Julius Caesar and then the adjectives that would describe him, but you know, you're asking for two more. And then, you know, based on whose opinion and in what historical context, and the students would actually provide information. They would add it to this map, they would bring it to class, it could help with class discussion, and, and so on. Here's a double bubble map. Sounds like bubble gum. And I bet that you could very easily fit your own disciplines into these types of uh, maps. And the questions that you use, then you can just kind of fill in your own, own um, concepts or thoughts about that. And a flow map, you know, what are the phases of the moon? Uh, you could even draw the images. They look to me like golf balls that have big chunks out of them. But anyhow, I'm sure that each of your disciplines that you teach have some sort of phases of something. And then you could um, draw a picture, they could draw a picture, you could provide the words, they would provide the images, and so on. Uh, cause and effect, multi-flow maps. Uh, and then you, know, you could guide them with questions. And I think these questions, this is what would probably take the most time, 
is to uh, come up with the questions, but make them related to the readings that you have them doing, and then have the students fill in the information as it goes through the as they go through each of the um, maps. Now you don't have to have one map for each of your topics. I mean, you could have maybe just one or two, or you could select as many as there are. But um, do this from time to time and be consistent in using it. And this would be a wonderful way of getting your students to be engaged with their reading because it's including visual information as well as the verbal. There's a brace map uh, for whole part relationships. And again, you could fit in your own discipline quite easily with something like this. And you could create these maps quite simply in uh, Word or PowerPoint. And then you could make them available in Blackboard, and the students could download them and fill in the information as they read. Now, another one, a bridge map for analogies. OK. Um, again, this was a link to show you actual student thinking maps. So uh, I just copied and pasted them from the website and put them this way. So the circle map, again, for defining in context, those are examples that students have done. And then I put the black box to the right or left of the example. Just that's what you would provide the students to come up with um, some sort of structure similar to that. But obviously, for the tree map, for classifying the black box on the left-hand side, much more complex tree. But they don't have to be as complex as that. You can see this one right here about colors. Um, you've got one, two, three levels here with a digestive system. You have, again, one, two, or three. Um, but it could be as complex as you might want to make it. But what's nice about this, um, initially when students see these, they're going, oh my gosh, I'm not an artist. I can't draw. But they can draw simple lines and arrows, and they can draw stick figures. So it could be a very easy way of getting themselves to visualize what they're actually reading in class. Again, again, more student examples. Um, I don't know who Wilbur is, but Wilbur looks like a pig. And there's some attributes about uh, Wilbur and then some sort of a statement. But imagine your students being able to do something like this after or during their reading. It completely engages them with the content. And then you can use this as a uh, kind of a springboard for a discussion in class. Again, some examples. And they can be as complex or as simple as you might want them to be. And you can mention to students, you know, say, if you can come up with another type of um, map, create one. And we can further discuss the possibility of its use in class. So I'm, I'm hoping that you're thinking at this point that, gosh, I could use this in my class for this. I could use it for that. And again, you wouldn't be using this for everything that they're reading. But every so often, when you think that there is a um, topic in a textbook reading or some other type of reading that would benefit from being visualized, uh, find a map that might fit with this. Now, the best thing to do is to work with your students at least through a couple examples so they know what to do. It's always a great idea to provide examples uh, for your students and then um, say, now you're on your own and you go ahead and, and work with this. But be available for them, too. OK, so um, in summary, I provided you with a lot of information. Um, I hope it wasn't too much information or information overload. Um, but Ideally, you should really identify who your students are and what kind of reading capabilities they have in class. Uh, you can do that by having them read physically in class from uh, the textbook. That can be really unnerving for some students, especially for those who are maybe unskilled readers. Um, but maybe you could do some sort of a pre-class survey or in-class survey or a survey in Blackboard to find out what their skills are, how they feel, what their capabilities are. Um, then somehow connect whatever you have selected for readings with those capabilities with your students, whether they be the textbook, whether it be um, outside readings, journal articles, and so on. But they really should have some sort of connection. And I don't really have it on here, 
but you should also connect your required reading or readings with your course goals and objectives. Um, look at your syllabus if you don't what, don't know what they are and decide for yourself, is the textbook being used efficiently? Am I using it just because or is it really going to be benefiting students because it connects um, to them as far as readers and it also connects to the class as far as your uh, goals and objectives go? So then integrate these tips and techniques throughout the semester that we've been talking about. And show a true commitment to helping your students become better readers. And by doing so, it will then tell them that reading is really imperative and fundamental to them being good students and being successful in the discipline and graduating um, with success. And that can be pretty hard for some students because some students come to campus with very low reading abilities. And as I mentioned, we do have a, writing, a reading clinic on campus. Um, you can help your students with it. Uh, come to us for suggestions if you find that students are really struggling. Um, but if a student isn't a good reader, they're not going to be doing that well here, um, really on any campus or in any academic setting. So as um, Bean, this author, mentions, we have to do more than take our students out to sea. We have to teach them to fish in the deep. And I think you get the um, analogy here as far as, you know, yes, they're in class, we've got the readings, but we want them to really understand the readings. We want them to really engage with the readings. We want them to be able to know why the readings are important and how they can integrate with the rest of their um, class, with other classes that they take, and their discipline as they uh, move toward graduation um, here at NIU. We have two full resource pages here with lots of great ideas. Um, this one right here in red, the thinking maps, this is where you get some ideas um, with uh, examples that students can actually use and you can use um, this is the Musgrove Handmade Thinking. That's the faculty member, uh, the English professor who helps the students work uh, individually and collaboratively. But all the others are excellent um, resources that you can use. Some of them might seem elementary because they might come out of uh, school-based settings, but anything that is done in a school-based setting can be tweaked enough uh, to fit very easily at the um, uh, university level as well. Okay, um, any questions or, or comments? You can either raise your hand uh, to speak verbally or you can put a comment at the very bottom in the chat area. No, Isabel, these will not be clickable. I'm going to be sending this PowerPoint presentation to you through email and then they will be clickable when you're actually in a, in a live presentation, or you can just copy and paste the URL. But in Wimba, uh, none of the links, as my colleague Stephanie told me, work. Um, so I'll be sending this presentation to you. OK. Um, Kate, did you want to use your microphone again? Go right ahead. Oops. Ah, OK, thanks. Um, I, I I have a couple of questions. I mean, one of the the techniques that you talked about that stood out to me right away uh, was specific directing questions about the reading to specific random random students um, mm -hmm. because I, I ask a lot of questions about reading in the class and I usually just ask for volunteers, um, but then it's the same five people every single time yes. <laughs> and and so you know I, that's something I'm you know, I'm going to start doing in class this afternoon. Um, do you have any advice or ideas about, I mean, because part of what's going to help this work in terms of compliance is a students having a bit of shame. Like if they haven't read, they'll be a little embarrassed. Um, mm -hmm. But when I at least teach uh, more introductory classes that are required, there are a lot of students, a whole lot of attitude and no shame. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Is this going to help them comply, or how would you deal with that kind of situation in class? Um, well, 
one way to really get students to comply would be to um, associate some sort of point value on responses. Now that would be way more than you could actually do in a class. Most likely your class has a number of students in them. But I think if you can show how important it is that the reading is done, that you can show the relationship between what's going on in class to the reading, you can show them how um, how well they can perform on tests. Um, it's a good question. And I'd have to really think a little carefully about providing just like one answer for you. But yes, the young students just kind of let it, they kind of, it rolls off their back until it comes time toward the end of the semester when they realize, uh oh, I've been not doing what I shouldn't have been doing. Um, so maybe just showing what the consequences might be for not reading, but, um, doing poorly on exams, not doing well on projects. Um, we don't really want to embarrass our students in front of other students. Doing that would definitely uh, limit or keep students who are not talking from talking anymore in the future. Um, let me get around to thinking about that and I'll get back to you. But um, I know I'm kind of avoiding your, giving you a, a straight answer, but I'd like to think a little bit more about that unless someone else has an idea. Um, but we, we don't, I know for sure we don't want to embarrass students because that is just, it's easy to do and we might feel good about it. And I think eventually students then just kind of develop more of a callus and they become more, um, they really become less inclined to participate in, in class. So can I get back to you on that? Okay, great. Anybody else with, with questions or comments? Oh, I see some smiley faces. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. Okay, so if we don't have any other questions, um, what we'd like you to do is, is it, oops, Stephanie. Sorry, I was going to jump in again, Janet. Isabel, so you raised your hand. Did you have a, a comment to make? Probably just your text comment then. She said you had an excellent presentation, Janet. Thanks, Isabel. Okay, Stephanie, I can't seem to push forward the um, feedback. The evaluation form has already been sent out, actually. So if oh, you okay. have that up on your screen, please do complete it. I'm going to go ahead, Janet, and turn off the archive. Archive. Okay, thank you.